Hello, everybody. Welcome to the University of South Florida M3 Center for Hospital Technology and Innovations uh, webinar today. It is my uh, pleasure to welcome all of you to this wonderful session that we are going to be sharing with you in in few seconds. So um, today we are going to we bring you uh, using games in the classroom session. My name is uh, Dr. Jihan Chobanolu. I'm the McKibben Endowed Chair Professor and the Director of the M3 Center at the University of South Florida. Today, I have a distinguished guest with me. Before I introduce her, I would like to just introduce you very quickly, uh, M3 Center. For those of you who may not know uh, M3 Center, we are a center for hospital technology and innovation at the University of South Florida. In the MoMA College of Business, our mission is to be able to create a cutting edge uh, research. Today, we are going to talk about using games in the classroom, uh, but I would like to invite you uh, to visit the M3 Center website uh, if you want to be able to see all of the reports that we publish, professional reports. We also publish three open access journals. We encourage you to submit your articles there, open access books, webinars, certificate programs, and conferences. So without further ado, I would like to uh, get into our topic. Today, we are going to talk about using games in the classroom. And I do have Dr. Anne-Mary uh, Sisson here from University of Florida. She is a lecturer there and she's been using games in her classroom. So I would like to invite her to here. Anne-Mary, welcome. Hello, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Jihan, thank you so much. And thank you for M3 Center for the invitation to join you today uh, to talk about actively engaging students using games in the classroom. That is so nice of you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us and we are our viewers and Mary. You know, when we announced your session, I got many emails that they were very excited. And as I can see right now, a lot of people are already watching this uh, webinar and I know that they will be watching after the fact, we'll send them the link. So the floor is yours and Mary, please um, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. So today I am actually going to show you some low tech tools to use while covering uh, three subjects. We're gonna talk about market segmentation or target audiences, uh, sales and selling strategies and revenue management. Um, I'll also explain how the games are played in a traditional classroom. And then at the end of the webinar, we can also discuss adaptations to virtual and hybrid formats. Uh, lastly, the games are presented in a hospitality setting, um, but these sh can also be shifted to other subject areas such as communication, marketing, and business. So I will go ahead and share my screen here and let's get started. All right, great. So again, uh, my name is Dr. Anna Marie Sisson and I'm with UF. So the first game that we are going to get started with is uh, speaking about a market segmentation game. So the purpose of the market segmentation game is to help students understand the importance of segmenting a market to identify suitable target markets. Um, after identifying a market segment, Students must design an event or um, a food and beverage menu or a lodging property to match their target market. So how the game is typically played is we start out with playing cards. Now playing cards, you might think of, you know, what do playing cards have to do with a market segment or a target audience? But the playing cards actually represent um, different areas like age, gender, and income. So the, the identification here is as follows. The number of cards represent age, the colored cards represent gender, and the suit cards represent the income. And so this is how we start out the game. The students don't actually know this information just yet. So we identify what market segmentation means and we have a quick discussion on it. And then we move into how the game is played. So the instructor would already have this information. So how the game is played. First, as the instructor, you would provide each student 
uh, or student group with a set of four playing cards. Then you would choose, tell the student groups that they can choose one target market or card that they do not want. The student groups then would then look at their cards and identify which target market or which card doesn't really fit within their target audience. As the instructor, you can identify that they can exchange one unwanted card for another. And they can exchange this card at random, which means the instructor would hold the pack of cards face down so they don't have any idea which new card or which new target audience or target market that they're receiving. In the second round of play, the instructors would then tell each student group that they can now exchange one more unwanted card for a new target audience. This time, the instructor tells the student groups that they can choose from a selection of cards face up to find a compatible target market. Usually, the student groups at this point want to choose a compatible target market that fits the three cards that they already have in their hand. And then lastly, the instructor would ask each team to design an event suitable to their target mix or to their market mix at a registration price that matches the market income. Now, I primarily teach event management, but this game can easily be adapted to either lodging or food and beverage, asking teams to design a lodging property or either like a four item food and beverage menu to match the target markets. And then you can always follow up with a discussion on how easy it was to design the event or to design the food and beverage menu where you had the choice of target market compared to when you were dealt a market mix. So as the instructor, these are the simple instructions for this market segmentation game. So let's see how it's played in a quick uh, round of instruction play. The instructor provides four cards to each student group. This group has drawn cards that represent a person in their 20s, 50s, the gender represents two people that are male and two people that are female. Their income levels represent two that are $50,000 income level, a person that's $100,000 income level, and a person that represents $70,000 income level. I then instruct student groups to choose one target market or that represents somebody not want. They can exchange the unwanted card for another one. The instructor then lets them know that they have to hold down the pack face down so they cannot see. Okay. In the second round of the game, the instructor then lets the student groups know they can exchange one more unwanted card or target market. This time, the instructor lets them choose from a selection of cards face up to find a compatible target market. All right, so that's just quickly how this market segmentation game would be played. The instructor. So showing some quick examples and some of my students and how they actually play the game. This is some examples of a, a lodging property and also a food and beverage property. And then the cards that would actually go along with the play. All right, so that would be the first game, the market segmentation game. And again, this is for the traditional online instruction. So for the next game that we have is a simple game that just involves, you know, some dice or some, you know, simple selling dice. And this game, there's a lot of variations in selling strategies 
and how to sell to different strategic markets. So there's a lot of variations with this one. With the steps in the personal selling process um, and using DICE, um, with the instructor's standpoint in this one, the students would actually work in pairs to role play uh, the steps in the selling process to a potential customer or a potential client. In this, in this gameplay, uh, students actually role play in three different variations. So first the instructor would, the instructor would say uh, to the student groups that they can roll the dice based on the number that they roll. Um, the second one is that they can play with a random number without looking. And the third type of gameplay is that they can choose a random number of what they want. And I'll show you the, the number on the dice based on how they're selling in a second here. Next, the student groups would roll the dice um, and sell via email. So instead of verbally talking and selling something face-to-face, -face, they would have to sell via email. And then finally, they would roll the dice and sell something via phone or email. So they would roll the dice and the numbers one, two, and three, they would sell via telephone. The numbers four, five, and six, they would sell um, via email. And again, a, a discussion here would, would showcase that how their selling strategy would differ from face-to-face, -face, selling via email, and selling via telephone. Again, which form of communication was easiest to make for the sale? and hardest to make for the sale. So you can see here from this table over to the right that based on the number of dice that they roll, you can sell um, a hotel package, a restaurant package, maybe you're selling a particular drink that night um, for happy hour. Uh, maybe you're selling an airline package or a, a casino package or casino upgrade, a car rental or a meeting space or a venue. Again, I primarily teach event management. So I have my students often work in selling as a meeting planner and the other person acts as the potential client or um, the potential uh, person working at a hotel venue. This can be often translated in many different ways. And working through the steps in the personal selling process, you know, you're acquiring that product knowledge, approaching the client, you know, qualifying that client, making the sale, and then closing the sale. So anytime you're working through the student groups, you're always making sure that the students are using that personal selling process in many different ways. So the students often have fun with this, especially if you're telling the student groups based on whether they have a random play or if you have to uh, roll the dice based on the number that they choose. So with the selling dice game, this often works um, in a traditional classroom, but can often work in breakout rooms and Zoom or um, even in Google Classroom as well. And lastly, for our revenue management game, the purpose of the revenue management game is to stimulate a stream of customer arrivals and purchasing decisions and stimulate how revenue manager controls the sale over time and a fixed amount of inventory. Students play the role of customers and then they switch and play the role of the revenue manager, giving thought toward customer purchase behavior and valuations of the company, company's pricing process throughout this game. So with the revenue management game, First, you would divide your students into groups and then provide each student two index cards. You would tell the students that the, you have an appealing vacation package for sale. I often use um, like a cruise package, um, something that's really difficult to price and has like a range of valuation and prices. Each student writes down the maximum amount that they're willing to pay. And this time they're acting as that customer. Next, you would then collect and mix the cards. It's usually good to have at least 20 different cards with 20 different prices. 
And this time the pack of cards serves as the customer population. Now you have the students switch and play the role of the revenue manager. And once they're in their groups, they're now acting as a group collectively as a revenue manager. So let's take a look and see how this game is actually played as a live simulation. I'll show you the game in two different ways. We have two simulations of static pricing, where the price doesn't change throughout the, the cruise package, sailing, and then dynamic pricing. So there's two simulations in this one. Let's see here. This one doesn't want to seem to play here. If there is a play button on the bottom, is there no on the on the video? Um, yeah. Let's see here. The first simulation, static pricing, is setting a price, observing customers arriving over time, and making purchase or no purchase decisions. The revenue it started in another place. Yeah, doesn't seem to be coming. The first simulation, static pricing. Hmm. Maybe it's not coming through here. Technology that happens. Hmm. Um, well. Maybe we have a hiccup here. If you'd like, you may want to stop your sh share screen Sorry and then. No, no problem. This happens. I mean, it's part of technology, so no. You want to stop sharing your screen and then see if you can find it and then we'll continue. Let me see if I can get this in another format here. Just one second. Sure, absolutely, no problem. And we are getting some um, questions. Um, okay, well, I'll come back to that in one second here. Um, okay, I will come back to that in one second. Um, so as the example from here, I actually have two examples from a live gameplay that I've shown in my classroom. Um, as the static pricing, you can see from the different groups, the prices don't change from the top. The student groups have cho sh chosen a price that doesn't change throughout the gameplay. As you're moving through the game, uh, the valuations come up on the index cards where the students have chosen the maximum amount that they chose for the, the package, the cruise package. If the target, the price on the package is either lower or at value, the groups either accept or reject the price. Um, and you either write an A or, or an R on the, the package for accept or reject. For dynamic pricing, this means that the revenue manager, the price can change at any given point in time in the game. So the groups have the option to adjust the price um, based on the valuation um, throughout the gameplay or the simulation. So as you're pulling the customer valuation cards, the groups then can decide, well, I want to change my price based on, you know, my customers aren't purchasing this price or a lot of customers aren't taking or buying the cruise package. So let's lower or raise the price throughout the gameplay. Again, you'll either write accept or reject on the, the table. The, the student groups have the ability to tally the revenue at the bottom of the gameplay. And then whoever has the most revenue at the end of each simulation for both static pricing and dynamic pricing, obviously win um, the round for each gameplay. Um, so this is my student example for both static pricing and dynamic pricing for each gameplay. 
and I'll go ahead and stop sharing there just so I can find this quick video of the gameplay. And then hopefully I can bring that back up in just one second here. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And so as the three, the three games for market segmentation, um, selling or strategic selling process, and for the revenue management game, um, all three games, like I said, have been brought forth in a traditional instruction format. Um, but can be adapted to online or hybrid formats and have been easily adapted within my classrooms at any given point. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, yes, we have actually a question about that. Uh, Faisal Mustafa has said uh, he was thinking about the online. So he's asking that if any of these games can be played online, you know, amid COVID, of course, right now, many universities do not have face-to-face -face courses or very limited. What are your thoughts about that, anna -Marie? Yeah, actually, all of the games can be adapted very, very easily. Um, with the market segmentation game or using target audiences, uh, there's online um, card, like playing card shufflers that can easily be used um, with adaptations. Um, so the students would just go in and uh, use this virtual playing card shuffler and it just randomly shuffles the cards for them. And then I usually have my students just take a screenshot of or a screen capture of the cards that they're using and then put that into a discussion board or you know put it into the the chat box to showcase the cards that they were randomly dealt. Um, and then they're given the opportunity to make up their event or their food and beverage or lodging property. For the dice game, um, Google and other types of websites have uh, dice shufflers or rolling dice uh, for virtual dice games. So you can easily move students into a breakout room together and just roll the dice together. And then they can communicate one-on-one -on -one with each other and sell to each other virtually or they can use a chat box or chat feature to simulate email communication or chat communication. And as well for uh, revenue management games, you can have students move into groups, into breakout rooms to decide what their pricing for the static pricing and dynamic pricing is, what they initially want to set their price at, and then you would move the student groups back out into the main classroom in order to move through the gameplay together. And then if they felt like they wanted to change their revenue pricing throughout the game, you would just quickly move them into a breakout room for about 30 seconds and then move them back into the main classroom for continuing play. That's great. Um, and Amelia, I would like to um, bring a couple of other questions that we have, but before we do. How long have you been using games in your teaching yourself? Oh gosh, I would say um, oh, probably about six years now. I Yeah, I started as an adjunct instructor from face to face and then I quickly had to move to an online format and I needed to learn how to engage my students in online. So I would say since about 2014 or so, 2015. So that was the that was the main drive for you to engage your students. Yes, I had to move to an online format, and I didn't know how to reach my students. Great, great, yeah. You know, uh, and Mary, when when you and I were initially talking about this this webinar that we are doing right now, is that I kind of like um, were in the same. Um, you know, shoes like you were in terms of how to engage. Of course, I turned into a technology. So I, I started using a, a property management system in road, you know, in my class. Before in road, I used Fidelio. So that was that component that I had to have something hands on. So there is one question. I know this might not be very easy question to answer, but let's give it a try. Um, Anodari is asking, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for, for this presentation. How can we integrate these games into assessment plan for a course? Because they are kind of like hard to assess, right? I mean, they are doing it as part, of, or do you simply just do it as part of a class? Don't even include that in the assessment. Um, you can actually include these into an assessment plan. Um, 
fully integrated these in online instruction form, I have each one of these in an assessment plan. Um, for the selling dice game, um, I include this in uh, a discussion form. So working with two students, they have to discuss back and forth in a selling strategy. Um, and based on the number of times that they communicate back and forth with each other is how many points they receive uh, in reply posts. Um, same thing with the market segmentation game. Um, if they use the virtual playing card shuffler, they just take the screenshot of their playing cards and then they develop an event or food and beverage menu um, in a discussion form. And the students have to reply post to each other based on the market segmentation, um, just replying to say like, did you reach your target audience? Or was this a good enough event for the cards that you were dealt? Or did it reach your target audience? And if as long as you're reaching discussion posts to trigger um, thought provoking questions, you can easily you know, see if your students are answering those questions very easily. Usually it's in more of a discussion form to assess whether or not they fully understand the purpose and the objectives. Wonderful. Uh, we also have Sedan Dawn. Uh, she's sharing an idea uh, with us that she's saying that I'm planning to give specific issues and ask my students to put themselves into guests or employees' shoes for uh, her communication and public relations course. And then she adds that it's going to be like acting on a stage, hopefully. Do you agree with that statement? Do you think that this is going to work for that class, particular class? Actually, yeah, this is a really good idea. Thanks so much for coming, commenting on this. Um, I think in addition to this as well, there was one time where I brought an improv, a student improv group to my class to help students think on their feet about improving in a more strategic way to sell something. So I think this is a really good idea. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, do you think that the video is gonna work? And I'm ready now. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm just grabbing it one second here. Sure. Yep. And meanwhile, you are finding this, I would like to ask our uh, viewers that Anne, uh, Anne Marie has prepared a wonderful handout for, uh, for this topic, games uh, in the classroom. If anybody is interested, you can go to the website that you see on your screen, m3center.org, games in the classroom. And there is a registration form there. So please go and click on there. It's a very simple form and you can register and we will be happy to send those materials to you along with, the, of course, this link for the video if anybody is interested. But I also would like to have an open um, invitation because Anne Mary and I um, were thinking about this. You know, we uh, all have different experiences and we would love to create a database. Um, Joe says that uh, he would love to get it exactly. Uh, Joe, please go to the uh, M m3center.org slash games in the classroom and please register in that short link. Uh, but what I would like to really do uh, with the help of Anna Mary is to create a database of games, you know, including maybe technological games as well too. So whoever is watching this webinar, if you have any idea, uh, obviously uh, besides the ones that, that Anna Mary is sharing, please share with us. Uh, Go ahead and click on that registration link. We'll send you the information and then you can, then we'll create this database for those of us. Like I'm one of them. I, I didn't really think about using games in, in the in the class. I'm teaching technology. So I'm thinking of about some ideas myself too, but we'll be happy to create a collective crowdsourcing kind of ideas about using games, not only in hospitality, but also in business courses, because we also have a, um, a comment, how can you use this game in a business ethics class? And Mary, do you have any um, guidance, insights on this or any kind of games, whatever that might be in a business ethics class? It's more general, not just hospitality, but. Hmm, actually, um, yeah, let me think about that for a sec. Business ethics. Um... 
There's a lot of ways that you can use other types of games. I think um, I'm thinking of like a fishbowl. Uh, there's a, a fishbowl game where um, students can actually, you put a, a bowl in the center of the room and students can actually enter their questions or their comments about um, business ethics or uh, different ways to type engage in business ethics or questions that they might have outstanding within business business ethics that you might want to address without this semester um, that you could easily incorporate within your lectures or class discussions. Um, and it's just kind of fun for them to drop it into the hat or drop it into the bowl. And that always gives that wonderful um, kind of like a kid um, um, approach to class, right? Because people like it, right? Games are always fun anyway especially if you can build a little bit competition around it. Um, and Mary, I want to share with you a comment from Edgar Bernardo. Uh, he's also using games in his class to teach concept and theories related to tourism. So that's great. And Edgar, if you please share with us, uh, please register in the link there. We would love to have your games also in featured in this database that we are going to uh, create. Um, and Mary, one question, you know, now that I, I just see this question, let me read the question first. Um, hello, I was just thinking if there is any book that source that explore document these games. Uh, to my knowledge, no, right? Do you do you know any of the books or any other resources? Oh, I don't know of any books, but I actually do have this, um, this document. It's like a little flip chart of... Um, it's a. Uh, it's from the Persky Adam Persky. Let's push that to the camera so we can. Yeah, just... it's like a little ring uh, flip chart of, right. and mine's all tabbed, <laughs> but it's a. Uh, it's a little. It's it's based on Bloom's taxonomy, but um, it's basically just uh, little ways of engaging like one minute papers, team based learning, just little identification of. Uh, at little ways that you can add um, games within your classroom and identification on how to use Bloom's taxonomy uh, in in your classroom, and it gives a lot of a lot of pocket evidence. Ideas. Um, yeah. So this is from Adam Persky. Perfect. And Maybe we can post that where they can find something like this in in that material, and Mary, the one that you prepared, if not already there, but. I would like, this is an open invitation to everybody. M3 Center, I don't know if you have noticed, but that's the Center for Hospitality Technology and Innovation. So that's where the innovation comes place. If we don't have a book or resources, why not create one? So, right, we, we talked about a database. Uh, I would like to invite whoever is watching uh, this particular webinar now, and if they are using or started to use any of these version of these games that's been featured in this webinar or maybe some others, please share with us. Go to m3center.org and um, send us a information. And we'll, we'll actually email also a, a website for this. But I like this website, Games in the Classroom, anyway. This is the, you are the name mother of, of this um, website. But I think that we can take this into a next step by doing it. There is more comments are coming. Let me first ask you if the video is ready so we can go there and then go back to the comments in a second. Yes, sir. Um, okay. So let me go ahead and play this. Uh, this Please share screen. your screen with us first. Yep. Wonderful. So we can see it because that video hopefully will work this time. Mm -hmm. And oh. I have some great questions and comments coming in. Okay, let me add that to the stream. Get the take out. Yeah, okay. Here yeah. you go. The first simulation, static pricing, is setting a price, observing customers arriving over time, and making purchase or no purchase decisions. The revenues are tallied in the end by the student. Each group sets a price for the package. The price is for the entire package and will remain fixed through the simulation. Their objective is to maximize the total revenue collected during the sale period. Customers, the index cards, arrive over time, and each customer buys if the number on the card, the customer valuation, is greater than or equal to the price. If the number on the card, the customer valuation, is lower than the price, 
the customer does not buy the package. So let's run through this. The instructor will pull one card after another and record sale or no sale using A for accept and R for reject in each column for the student groups. This table shows a sample simulation for four groups. So if we pull one card, this customer pays, wants to pay $1,000 for the package. Each group has already set their price. The first group set their price at $500. For this group, the customer evaluated the package at $1,000, which means we would accept the price, which we would put an A here. Group two set their price at $1,200 for the package. The customer cannot afford this package. We would reject the price. So we would put an R. Group three put the package at $700. The customer says they'll pay $1,000. We accept the price. And group four, $2,000. We reject the price. Now throughout the simulation, all four groups are keeping tallies of the customer valuation prices and they'll tally the total revenue at the end. So the instructor does not have to keep track of the revenue for them. Again, the second customer valuation, $750. Again, group one, total package price, $500, we accept. Group two, $1,200. For this package, we reject the price. Group three, $700. For this package, we accept the, the price. And group four, we reject again. So you continue on with the simulation as long as you get through all of the customer valuation cards. Again, at the end, the, the student groups tally the total revenue. When groups begin calculating costs in order to accept or reject, use this time to discuss fixed and variable costs. Ask students to simply base their pricing on their perceptions of how customers will value the product. And the second simulation of dynamic pricing is setting a price, but that price can change any time any number of times. The objective is to identify the ability to forecast dynamic pricing based on customer evaluations over time. Run at least two simulations of this game. After each simulation, ask to start thinking strategically rather than simply setting a price. Shuffle the cards to remind the students of uncertainties in the market. Hide the cards so students cannot see how many customers remain. Tallying revenue is complicated in this simulation, so record the price changes for each group carefully. On this table, it shows the simulation run with four groups, and we'll go through the simulation together. Because dynamic pricing changes over time, do not announce the time remaining in the sale of the package during the first round of play, as many companies may not know when the sale will end. In the next rounds, start to announce how many days left until the package departure date or the cruise departure date. When groups begin to panic at the last minute to lower prices, I usually pause the game and discuss long-term customer behavior and expectations and the dangers of last minute offers. Don't criticize the students for lowering the prices at the end, as they may not, that might not be the right strategy, but rather discuss how customers form expectations of low prices at the end of the sale. So let's go through a couple examples together about dynamic pricing. For the customer valuations, our first customer valuation would like to pay $800 maximum for this package. Group one has set their price initially at $500, which means we would actually accept this package. So we would put an A here. Group two set their initial package price at $1,300, which means we would reject this. 
Group three initially set the package at $900. Again, we'll reject the price. Group four put the package at $5,000 initially. Again, we'll reject the price. So at this point in the game, as the instructor, I'll ask all student groups if they want to change their package price for the second round. If they do change their package price, I'll indicate the new package price in the second column on the spreadsheet. Group four has decided to change their package price. They realized this was too high, so they lowered their package price to $4,000. The rest of the groups decided to keep their package price. So we go through the second round of customer evaluations. This customer evaluated the package at $1,200. So again, group A, they kept their price at $500, so we accept the price. Group two, they kept their price at $1,300. We have to reject the price. For group three, the package price was $900, so we accept the price. And then group four, even after they lowered the price to $4,000, the customer valuation was still too low. We reject the price. So moving through the customer evaluations, you would continue on filling out the spreadsheet, moving through all of the customer evaluations, announcing as you get closer to the end of the sale. Again, the students would keep track of their total revenue and indicate it here at the bottom of the spreadsheet. Okay. Okay. Great. And we have some more questions and comments as well. Yeah. So um, one question, um, a comment actually. So I, I, I want to bring this up here. Joe, it's always been so difficult to uh, gauge how students are comprehending what's being said in a virtual Zoom session. Injecting games into classroom is an awesome strategy and solution. He says, thanks. We also thank him for this comment. Uh, I agree, uh, and I would love to hear more of you as you um, integrate games into your teaching. So there's one question here. Uh, Soji uh, is asking, what are the main components you include in the rubrics part while assessing the student? What was the biggest challenge you faced while using games in classroom? Uh, great question, Soji. Thank you so much. Uh, the biggest, the main component of the rubric part is making sure that you still have some kind of objective and that you're still reaching some kind of assessment. So in any kind of lecture, any kind of assessment, in a traditional classroom or online, make sure that you're still reaching that uh, student learning outcome or objective and that you have some way to assess that. So whether it, if you're using a game, make sure you follow up with a discussion or you're asking them like, how did you actually learn this? Did you feel that using a selling strategy via email or telephone was easier? What was hardest? Uh, what was, did, did acquiring the customer make it harder? Did uh, reaching, you know, objections of the selling process make it harder? Or in revenue management, always prompt the student to give you more because just playing the game is fun, but they still need to tie it back to the learning objective. And so just prompting them in a discussion format is the easiest way to make sure that they're obtaining that information. That's great. Um, thank you for that answer. So uh, Sedan asked one more question. Uh, actually, is a little bit different this time because she's asking about the research component of this. Uh, she's asking you, uh, did you have chance to measure the difference in terms of student success between course with games and course without games? I assume that she's referring to the same course if you were to integrate the games versus not. Have you ever been involved in a study like this or thought about it, Anna Mary? 
Uh, actually, Sedan, I have not, but I would be highly interested in, in doing something like this because uh, my I do research curriculum and pedagogy, so I have never actually um, a done a before and after or with or without study. So it'd be quite interesting. That's wonderful. So that's an invitation to Sedan to yeah. work with you, right, and Mary, so that you can create a nice research study. Of course, if anybody else is interested, speaking of research, you know, when we announced this this particular webinar, uh, we, you know, emailed to Trinet and, and, and other uh, educators uh, around the world. And then we got one response, and Mary and I got one response that I would like to share with you. Uh, this particular uh, professor is from uh, Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. Let me share my screens because I think it's interesting, especially to those of you. And um, we will also include this in our website as well too. Uh, she gave us the permission to share with you. So I'm gonna just uh, click on share and see if I can show you this particular article. She actually wrote an article. So Sedan, this is maybe an answer to your question. Uh, obviously, um, uh, Sheila Mooney, uh, I hope I didn't butcher um, the name here, Tracy Harkinson, Harkinson uh, they did this article in Anatolia um, Journal, Assessment for Learning in University Settings, Fun and Games. And also, um, Sheila has actually shared with us some references. So I would like to show this here. Obviously, we will include that into the website. Again, the website is m3center.org slash games in the classroom. Or if you are interested to get information about webinars like this, please go to m3center.org and become a member. But I see that there are quite a few different um, you know, references here, which might be very, very helpful to those of you who are thinking about um, utilizing games in the in the classroom. Um, okay, let me see if there is any other. Um, there's more comments coming in. Okay, Ozan is also saying that um, uh, she is interested in research as she always used role plays and case studies in her courses. That's perfect, wonderful. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be happy to connect you um, and and then see if we can actually create a study because. What will happen is that if we were to find more evidence that games do actually indeed help learning, right? So the, the key performance indicators here could be maybe the satisfaction in the course, could be the grades that the students earned or some kind of assessment of the learning, maybe the final exam or whatever, to see that if there is any difference, if there is, um, not only this will be, of course, good publication, uh, good experimental study, but also will help a lot of um, educators out there as well, too. And here, Edgar uh, Bernardo, again, I apologize for those of you if I am butchering your name because I'm very used to be my name to be butchered. So, um, but, but I feel bad when I butcher somebody else's, but I apologize in advance. We are running such a study comparing different universities here in Portugal would be great to expand it across. That's wonderful, Edgar. So Sedan, uh, maybe uh, you can share your information with us. Uh, Sedan and Ozan can communicate with you along with Anne Mary. We can try to create some kind of a study together. I think this will be wonderful. That's one of the reasons that we are doing these kind of webinars to be able to kind of spark interest in research and of course, uh, get access to resources. And Mary, anything else you wanna add? Oh gosh, I don't think so. Uh, anytime you can incorporate games in your classroom, uh, the better. Uh, my students always, you know, they're hesitant at first, but if you just keep pushing, they'll learn it and they have so much fun. Wonderful, wonderful. And Alicia, Ali from UK, a great way to engage students, many thanks. And here's the question, have you, uh, found any students reluctant to engage with this type of learning? And if yes, how do you overcome this? I think this is a great question, right, Anne Mary? Yes, um, actually, yes. They always have hesitancy in role playing. They're very uncomfortable when role playing, but in hospitality, role playing is critical. Uh, but the ways that I overcome it is um, just try and try again. Uh, you know, in, in practice, if you can give them an example and if you can show them how it's done, uh, eventually they'll want to do it. And 
that's the, the best way to do it. This is wonderful. That's great. Absolutely. And I see in the chat box that uh, Sedan and Edgar and Ozan, they are all exchanging information. And Mary, you are part of the team as well. So I would like to um, invite all of you, uh, this team here, once you complete this research, come back here and present your results. We'll be happy to do another webinar with you. So this is great. Um, uh, in keeping the time that we have promised to people, we are going to conclude this session. And Mary, uh, thank you again. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us and also all the resources. As I have uh, mentioned to you earlier, that and Mary created a very nice package. Uh, is a reading package resources and, and some of the instructions for these games that uh, she's been using in her class. So please go to m3center.org slash games in the classroom. And there is a little registration link there. So please feel free to click in there, put your email name. We will send these notes to you. And if you want to reach us, uh, our email is info at m3center.org, info at m3center.org. And I'm going to, I think, I I think I can write it here. So this email, uh, this way you can also email me as well. So let's see if I can bring this up. So this is the email of our center. Uh, please feel free to any ideas about this. And also when I just remind you that we are have a good intention of creating a database of games, not just in hospitality, but in business uh, education maybe as an overall. So if anybody wants to be part of this project, please do email me and let me know. We'll be happy to have you. Uh, we are also having, again, great uh, communication going on. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anne Mary Sisson from University of Florida, which is the other university in uh, in the in our backyard. We love University of Florida, of course. That's, that's a competition between USF and UF all the time. But uh, we would like to thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you so much for your efforts. Yes, Dr. Tian, thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you to the M3 Center today. Of course. And we would like to also thank all of the attendees who are watching us live. You really made this very interactive and fun. Uh, but also, I would like to thank those of you who are watching this in recording. Please feel free to communicate with us. If you have any questions, ideas, or any other webinar ideas, we are happy to do um, a webinar. If you have an innovative idea that you would like to share, again, uh, my email, I'm going to share one more time, info at m3center.org. And I would like to wish you uh, a good afternoon, night, evening, morning, whatever that might be. Thank you. We'll see you soon.